Any other comments before we get started? All right. Well, we're honored to have Jay Paul Moore here with us tonight. Um, I ask, we always ask our speakers how they would like to be introduced because we want to give them some, you know, some opportunity to, uh, you know, have some input on that. And so Paul was nice enough to write out a, a, a very lovely introduction. And I'm going to cover that part, but I was going to do a different introduction myself. I was just going to say, everybody who has had a feature of their native garden showcased in an article in Southern Living, raise your hand. Paul. All right. <laughs> yeah. Only, only Paul. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. Uh, November 2016, uh, roll out the red, no, roll out the green carpet, I think was the name of, name of the article. Um, I had the pleasure of touring Paul's garden with a bunch of other people long ago, and there's nothing quite like standing on a carpet of moss. Uh, you just sort of have to take your shoes off. So um, with that in mind, uh, Paul is and has been an advocate for native plants for over 30 years. He is actually a mentor for many of the uh, uh, stalwart native plant supporters in the national area now. His newest passion centers around moss and its use as a lawn alternative and or a garden feature. Paul, with a glimmer in his eye, says that moss, often misunderstood, is the equivalent of a puppy. It's soft and fuzzy and people can't help but touch it. Let's take a deep dive into the world of moss with Paul Moore. All right. Thank you for that introduction. And I uh, certainly want to thank you, Richard and Brian, and uh, for setting this up. I know, uh, I mean, just a little technical stuff. We're in new territory. Uh, I'd like to start off, but here's my disclaimer. I have no formal training in bryology, which is the scientific study of mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. It sounds more like a disease to me. But anyway, learning about moss is not the easiest thing. In fact, most mosses don't even have common names. Moss identification be problematic as well because many varieties require the use of a hand lens, while others need the greater magnification of a microscope to discern their unique characteristics. You might be asking yourself at this point, why would I want to have, why would I even want to grow moss? And frankly, it's loads of fun. I found that those interested in moss are a pretty tight knit community. And although our numbers are small, most are willing to share their knowledge and love of this often misunderstood and underappreciated plant. I would like to share my story about my journey into the magical world of moss. Okay, here if I can uh, get to my uh, program here. Okay, here. I do need to get these windows off, I think, here. I think I can see this okay. Can everybody see the screen okay? Are you sharing your screen? Uh, let me, let me try that. Go back one here. Sorry, I've been talking to you muted. It's at the bottom in the middle. There's a green box, share screen. All right, you're on Mac. I've, uh, I'm there. Now I just got to find my program. Can you see that? Not yet. Well. On my options here, I'm not seeing how to share my program. Do you see the share screen button in the on the bottom in the middle? Yes, I do. Okay, so when you pick on it, it should give you a screen that says desktop one, desktop two. Oh, there you are. I'm seeing you now. Okay. Uh, are you seeing this? Yes. Okay. How about that? There you Perfect. go. 
And can we close, how do I close out these boxes on the right? It's interfering with the... We don't see it, you're okay. No, but he, I, can't, he I, can't see, I can't see the type. I think I can get through it here. Let's just proceed and see how we do here. Mosses are a type of bryophyte, which is a type of non-vascular plant. This means they lack a xylem and phloem that most plants use for transporting water from roots, leaves, and stems. True mosses are divided into two groupings, the acrocarps, which are more the mounding and upright form, and pleurocarps, which have more lateral or spreading branches. Mosses in the environment. Mosses are an environmentally benign way to conserve water, control erosion, filter rainwater, clean up hazardous chemicals, and sequester carbon. Also, mosses serve a valuable ecological role as bioindicators for air pollution, acid rain, water pollution, and wastewater treatment. Well, this is where it all started for me. Many, many years ago, I uh, really got interested in native plants back in the, gosh, probably in the early to mid 80s. And uh, so I had been growing them for quite some time here and quite a collection of, uh, of native plants, beech trees and native azaleas and native rhododendron and just about anything else you can imagine as a woody native plant her, or herbaceous perennial. But as you can see, that's a, that's, a, that's a thick lawn right there. All that right there is just turf grass. And that's, you know, a lot of people that have any kind of wild garden don't have, you know, a turf grass type lawn. And, and but I, I liked it because of the, uh, the transition where I could just walk out in it and kind of have a kind of a theater uh, view of all the plants in the garden. Well, then after, uh, you know, as most of you know, that if you've tried to grow grass in middle Tennessee, it's a, it's a tough job. And especially for me living on top of a hill outside of Nashville in Bellevue uh, and the soil is very thin and I just got tired of planting grass seed every year. So I took this one section, this little lobed section of the, uh, of the lawn and said, I'm not gonna sow grass seed and I'm just going to see what happens. So what I did, I just removed all the dead and dying grass that was there and uh, kept the debris off of it and within months, I began to see moss starting to appear. Now, I did have a little bit of moss, you know, maybe about a two or three foot diameter section that was growing there. So I knew that, you know, that it was friendly toward moss, but I didn't know how friendly. So I just continued to watch this and let it develop through the summer. But again, keeping it, the leaves off of it. And then after the second year, it turned into this most amazing thing. And uh, I, uh, I became Picasso with a leaf blower and learned how to blow <laughs> the leaves neatly to the edge. I mean, it, uh, I had lots of practice, but I just loved how the, that verdant green moss looked against the leaves. It was just, just the coolest thing. And uh, so I started uh, sharing some photos with some friends some gardening friends and showing them this. And they were like, wow, this is, this is, this is cool stuff. Well, I got really bold. Again, this is this, uh, can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this again was that original area there. And uh, I decided to take this, actually this much more sunny area over here and uh, see if I could grow moss there. And I knew I was gonna be pushing the limits on that area because again, it was more sunny. But I proceeded to go about it and uh, I added, uh, soil, uh, sulfur, granulated sulfur to the soil, which I really didn't have to do, but I wanted just to make sure the soil was acidified and try to get conditions just as good as I possibly could getting started. And this is a view after, oh, about a year or so. And again, you can see this original lobe that I started and this is looking down on this area. You can see the moss really filling in here and still uh, you can barely see it forming in that area. This is another area uh, closer to the house and uh, it was really starting to fill in here as well. To kind of speed, uh, speed up the process, I, uh, I purchased some moss and it came in a box 
you know, with different size pieces of moss. I thought it, it might make it look better and feel better if I did all the edges first and then let it fill in in the middle. And that was working pretty well that, you know, the edges started to fill in and you can see the moss starting to get a little bit thicker even beyond that point. This is uh, another angle of the, of the lawn and you can see again that original area and this, and this area just barely starting to get that hint of green. Then uh, after, after I'd say probably about uh, four years total, this happened. And I couldn't believe how great it was looking. And um, this, uh, I actually you know, kind of detailed the edges just, just like if I'd had a you know, regular turf grass lawn and it just made a beautiful transition uh, over into a moss lawn. That's a view from the house looking back over a Pachysandra bed into the moss lawn. Another view from upstairs again, um, you can see where the moss is, is filled in now and uh, has just a, just the most incredible look, just a very peaceful look, which I love. And uh, in different uh, atmospheric conditions, it just really comes alive. This is a, a fog coming up uh, off of uh, the Harpeth River, uh, creating this really ethereal look in the moss lawn. Just another section of that original moss lawn with a big native beech tree there in the corner that I'd planted years ago. And in the fall, I love it. Uh, again, I don't let the leaves pile up, but uh, I love the, just the look of the freshly fallen uh, leaves on the moss. It's another section in the, in the fall where the leaves are just starting to fall on the moss. Fall color in the big leaf snowbell tree there. And this is how it looked last year. Uh, we, uh, we painted our house a, a dark gray, almost kind of a black gray. And I just love how it makes everything green pop. I think our house has been about every color there is, but we really like this one. Here's some moss facts for you. Mosses inhabit nearly every ecosystem on earth and number as many as 22,000 species. Mosses can lose up to 98% of their moisture and still restore themselves and when water is replenished. This ability of actually for moss to do that is called poikula hydra. And uh, they have taken samples of moss, biologists that are studying moss, taking samples that are kept in these uh, paper envelopes, put them in a petri dish after 40 years and add water and they completely rejuvenate. Uh, another thing that's I think really fascinating about uh, sphagnum moss that it's, uh, I can't read because of the thing there. If you go to the bottom and click uh, the participants in the chat buttons, that'll get those windows out of there, I think. Uh, I have to escape the screen, but anyway, if you can read, you can read that. So yes, um, and, and another thing that's interesting about uh, moss is it doesn't have roots, but it has root-like structures called rhizoids that just kind of just adhere, stick to the ground. And one of my favorite uh, views is from inside, looking out onto this moss lawn area, and I try to capture it in uh, different seasons. So it always looks so different. It's in the winter time, sunrise. Definitely ice storm right there, actually. The moss is still green. That's what moss looks like with snow on it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after that, I became somewhat obsessed about moss and started reading everything I could get my hands on. And as with the case with moss, you know, it's really hard to get information. Um, the biologists, you know, are off busy, you know, doing their research papers and not, you know, they don't care about us gardening, gardening types. 
So, you know, I had to read what I could, uh, uh, meet a few folks that were uh, interested in moss and we would share information. So uh, that is and continues to be a real fun thing for me to do. And I decided I wanted to really, to really know more about the different varieties of moss because in the moss lawn, I have more of what they call the, the pluricarp variety, just the flat spreading type. Well, I had been learning about uh, different types of mosses that uh, like the, the pluricarp, I mean, uh, yeah, the acrocarps that have more mounding form. And I just wanted to showcase the range of varieties and colors and textures of moss. So I started this area in front of the house. And that's really been a fun project just to be able to see how, how the mosses uh, mingle and how they look contrasting with each other. And which is often the case when I, when I first plant moss, I'll put like porch screen on it. And that keeps, it, uh, keeps the animals from digging in it initially, kind of helps uh, retain some of the moisture and, uh, and just kind of gives it a head start. And I'll leave it on for several weeks or you know, if, if I know the birds are really active in building nests and they're looking for worms, I'll keep it on a little bit longer at times. Uh, I got an opportunity uh, being a photographer to go to Iceland on a 10 day photographic expedition with uh, two of the top, well, one of the top photographers in the UK, uh, David Ward and, uh, and Daniel Bergman, who is a uh, native of Reykjavik. And of course, the first thing that I, you know, there's not much over there as far as greenery, so they have moss galore. So I was in heaven both photographically and, and all the different mosses. I mean, who could not love this? Uh, this is a variety. Uh, actually, the locals call it Shrek moss because it looks like the color of Shrek. But uh, it's just, an, just a gorgeous moss and it usually grows near water like that. And if you look at it really close, it's maybe hard to tell there. It almost looks like carpet threads just stuck on end. And uh, you might be able to see it a little bit better in this picture when I'm looking actually straight down on it. And those are water droplets that formed on top. And uh, it was just, just looked like little gemstones sitting up there. And then the uh, lava fields there, after you know, the, uh, the uh, lava hardens and cools, the first uh, thing to develop on the lava is moss. This is a, a variety, the common name is gray moss, which is a uh, racometrium. And it just, for miles and miles and miles, this gray moss uh, covers the ground. It's pretty spectacular to see. Uh, one of the things that uh, I have been doing for years is uh, going to the Cullowhee Native Plant Conference at Western Carolina University. And as part of that, they always have field trips that you can sign up for. And uh, last year I signed up for a moss field trip and uh, it was just loads of fun. Just out with other plant lovers, moss lovers, and uh, with two uh, bryologists and just learning about mosses. And that's my dear friend, Annie Martin, that you're gonna hear more about a little bit later, taking it all in. Showing different samples there. Gonna miss that this year. This is our intrepid group. It's 6,053 feet. And then there's moss yoga. My uh, daughter uh, owns a business called uh, Triluna Wellness and as part of their uh, programs they do for corporate and individuals, they do uh, yoga. And she said, Dad, can I do some yoga classes on the moss lawn? And I said, have at it. So they were out there playing one day, getting ready for uh, their first moss class. I asked them to do this for me. And this just turned out to be just loads of fun. You know, everybody, you know, they were uh, just enamored with the moss and thought it was the coolest thing. And this is a lot of these people were from out of town. This was an Airbnb experience. So they were having a blast seeing Nashville for the first time and doing uh, yoga on a moss lawn. Okay, Mikey Moss, getting started. Are you a candidate for a moss lawn or garden? 
The answer is, uh, well, you can read it because I can't. <laughs> yes, if you, if you have, have an area of, of your lawn that's too wet, too compacted, too, too acidic to grow grass or anything else, moss is really the perfect candidate. Uh, here's a way that I've actually just different ways I've transplanted it. You can take a, like a fork or just most anything and just gently pry it up and move little sections and almost like plugs like you would like zoysia grass plugs or something. Here I used a fork and I uh, got an old barbecue uh, spatula out and you could do larger sections. And in areas in the moss lawn that began to grow beyond edges where I had it planted, I would use this extra moss. I would just cut it and remove it. And that would be kind of like my, if I wanted to start in a new area or if I needed to patch the moss, then I had this extra moss I could work with, kind of like a moss nursery. This is me uh, patching an area with some of the little plugs of moss. This is another area I was planting some moss and I used one of those little star tillers, rotary tillers, hand tillers to uh, kind of work up the soil. It just kind of like you're planting grass seed. And here's uh, three different types of moss that I ordered from Mountain Moss, my friend, Annie Martin. I just had them laid out on a tray there. You can just see the different color and textures just right there in the trays. This is a section of uh, moss lawn where it really wasn't doing well. And so I said, well, I'm just going to, now that I know about some other different types of moss, I'm going to see about just removing this moss and transplanting with a different variety. So I got the soil all prepared. I actually put down a little thin layer of, of soil there. And then that was the after. And what's really critical when you're planting moss is to make sure it makes good contact with the soil. You can firm it in with a, with a tool like this, or you can just step on it, but keeping good contact with the soil is absolutely critical. And if you first plant it, then, you know, every several days or so, you need to go back and walk on it again, and just make sure it again stays in good contact with the soil. So you can tap that pretty, pretty hard and not have an issue? Not an issue. You can jump up and down on it. Oh, okay. Yeah, moss, you know, really doesn't mind the foot traffic. It doesn't like to be what I call rough house, and you can't play football on it or anything like that, but you can walk on it a lot. And here I've just put the porch screen on it again, just kind of keep the leaves and everything off of it. And here's a close up. You can see the porch screen, and I've got covered an area. And this is probably one of my all time favorite mosses. This is called Climacium or tree moss. And it looks like a little conifer tree. And it's, look at the texture of that compare, compared to this low growing Nyum moss right here. I mean, it's just daylight and dark difference between those two varieties. And here's a great way to propagate moss, especially the tree moss. You can do what are called fragment cuttings and just take a pair of scissors and just cut these little tiny pieces like this and you can plant those. That's what looks like after you've kind of cut and gathered them. This is a close up of uh, the reproductive parts of moss. They're called sporophytes. And uh, actually the, the spores will develop in this top part here, but it's pretty uh, amazing how they can catch the water drops. Again, looks like little gemstones. And this is a type of moss called Polytricum. And look how showy these sporophytes are. I mean, they're probably one of the showiest uh, of all the different varieties. Look like little torches. Well, before, uh, before there was Southern Living, there was Garden Design Magazine, and I used to do a lot of photography for them. And uh, they did this uh, piece on the adventures of Moss Man. So I was able to photograph and uh, uh, that for that magazine back in the spring of 2015. That was the lead photo that we used uh, for the article. 
And then this is the Southern Living article, roll out the green carpet. Uh, this was one of the probably the, the craziest photo shoot. Uh, they, they sent their own photographers up to photograph. And the day, the couple of days before, the weather conditions were perfect. And I photographed it just like I was doing it for an assignment. But I knew when they were coming, this major uh, storm was coming through. And to, keep, to get these kind of conditions, she had was the photographer, a, a guy with a laptop that was tethered to her camera. The wind was blowing 20, 30 miles an hour, leaves going everywhere. I was chasing leaves. You know, it was just like, it took all three of us to get just even a couple of hours worth of photography, but we were able to pull it off. But it was, it was quite comical. And this is the photograph I got before they, before they came. What is the shack? What's, what's, what was that's, a, that's a garden shed. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's where all, all my tools go. And once we converted our garage over to living space, I had to have a place for all my stuff. And then I uh, was introduced, uh, later became my good friend, Annie Martin. Um, this is her book, The Magical World of Moss Gardening. And just before this uh, book uh, went to press, uh, we discovered each other and uh, we were able to get uh, one of my photographs in it before it uh, actually went to press. That was the photograph she used. Then uh, Talk of the Town came out with their drones and uh, did a bunch of aerial photographs and did a piece on that, which was pretty wild with a drone flying around everywhere. And then in 2015, I did a keynote presentation for the Kulawi Native Plant Conference. That's me with my pal, Annie Martin, who only wears purple. <laughs> Here's some just um, uh, moss maintenance uh, things to consider regarding watering, weeding, disease control, and critter damage and so forth. Well, watering, the, the great thing about uh, watering moss, it only takes about five or 10 minutes to water it. Uh, the actual leaves are typically one cell thick. So even like just atmospheric moisture can be enough to, to water it. But here I'm basically watering everything around the moss area, but of course it gets it when you're watering too. But again, just a few minutes and it's, it's all the moisture it needs. Is moss tolerant of dry conditions? Well, take a look here, the soil's cracked. And what moss does, it just goes dormant if it doesn't get the moisture. Is it cold hardy? Absolutely. Uh, they've actually found uh, moss in ancient glaciers and been able to revive it. So it was like the first or second thing on the planet. I think algae was first and then mosses, so they they are, they look delicate, but they are actually quite tough and resilient. This is a, a moss growing in Warner Park on the asphalt uh, edges. Uh, this is one called Entodon, Entodon seductrix, uh, growing on pure asphalt. I see that one a lot in glades. That one, yeah. And you can see here where it got something knocked it up. You could just go peel it, you just fold it right back and it'd be happy as it could be. And then you have stuff like this that happen. During, during the uh, summer months, when I'm trying to water everything else around, the, the moss area becomes kind of an oasis for birds. And so they got in uh, one, I mean, in all the years I've had it now, they got in one summer and just really wreaked havoc. And it took me a couple of weeks to kind of get everything patched up again. But, it uh, took some effort, but certainly worth it. And then it comes to weeding. Yep, you gotta weed it. And uh, you can go the chemical route, which I don't recommend. And uh, I can just go in maybe twice a year and hit it hard, hand weeding. And actually a lot of these weeds are actually annual weeds that go away anyway. So if I'm just trying to get it cosmetically perfect, I'll go and hand weed it. And you pull each thing, one of those up? Each, you pull each one of those up? Sure. 
Oh, wow. It's great therapy. <laughs> and especially now that people really have time to do it. But uh, here's my friend, Annie. You know, if you've got a couple of friends over, it works out great. And actually, one of, one of the, the, the funniest times I've ever had any help weeding was when we were doing the, one of the uh, yoga, moss yoga things. The, one of the ladies brought her daughter, and she was the best moss weeder I've ever had. If you water too much, you can get some fungal issues. This is a little, little powdery mildew forming on the moss, which cleared up almost as soon as I stopped watering it. I just went through one period where I just kind of overdid it. And uh, one morning I saw some deer out on the moss lawn and I went, to sh went outside to shoo them off and one of them went running across and put on its brakes and skid about a foot and a half there. But that was a pretty easy fix. And as far as, you know, in the fall, just take a leaf blower. And here, I really like those uh, battery pack blowers. I mean, I can, this area that you see, I can blow it off in five minutes or less. I actually have a newer model that's even more powerful that really is just no effort at all to keep it blown off. Again, how it looks in the fall. And then I said, well, oh, this will be a great before and after. So I went and got my blower and then about five minutes later, you got this. Then there's wildlife. I have a little uh, moss uh, covered bird bath and it's habitat for lots of uh, uh, different toads and and uh, I've got lots of uh, box turtles that hang out that I feed bananas and strawberries. I've got one that comes back every year. I've recognized the shell and it comes every year and I, it waits for me. It's usually by the door, front door about 7.15 before it goes over to the moss lawn. All different kinds of moths and butterflies. Trapdoor spider. And here's some uh, different moss projects I've been a part of. Do consultation for helping people install moss. This was the, my first one I ever did some years ago now. This is a before project I did where we put moss around all the stepping stones. What do you do to prepare that dirt, that picture you had? What, what would you do to that dirt? Anything? Just, again, just like you're planting grass seed, just rough it up. Again, just creating a little bit of, you just don't want hard packed soil because it makes it harder for the moss to adhere. So just rough it up and, and uh, put it down, uh, lightly water it, kind of step on it, kind of water it again, kind of, you know, different stages until you get it like you want it. This is an area around a, a uh, flagstone path. And we used uh, different kinds of screen on that to keep uh, the animals off of it. This is one of my favorite projects I did. I actually photographed this for Garden Design Magazine. And uh, this was such a cool project because before they had moss, they had major issues with standing water in their backyard. I mean, literally like a after a big rain, they might have a foot of water in spots. Well, they, uh, they, they, they bought moss and put moss in the entire backyard and it almost completely eliminated, eliminated the water issue. Well, if you think about it, it's just like a giant sponge. So it absorbed the water and uh, uh, made a beautiful uh, solution to a problem they had. That's another view of that same uh, project looking back toward the house. A friend of mine just put in a stumpery. Have you heard of the, that type of garden before, a stumpery? And these are some stumps that they put in the garden, some you know, laying on their side, some upright. It's very uh, old style of garden, been around for a long, long, long time. And uh, this is where we put moss in all these new areas to fill in. And this is probably one of the coolest projects I've worked on. A friend of mine 
uh, built a house over uh, near um, 12th Avenue South, contemporary home with this two-story glass atrium that's open at the top. And he's got, uh, he contoured the soil in there and put in this one giant boulder. And uh, imagine looking at that from inside your home. There's another view of it there. That's really pretty. And he said, uh, I mean, I've talked to him several times since. He says, he says the moss is so happy it looks like it's heaving out of the soil. And this was a project I did uh, during the beginning of the coronavirus. <laughs> uh, they had this uh, big, large oval around these formal pavers. And uh, it's, the idea is to create just kind of almost like a little emerald uh, green space right there. Look out, this is looking from inside their house out. Here's uh, just a few pictures from my mossy world. This is a, a type of moss some people call rose moss or rhodobrium ontariens, and it looks like little rosettes. These are like pea sized. This is the polytricum moss. This is the common name of this. This one actually does have a common name, fern moss, Thuidium delicatulum. Uh, this is uh, a really cool moss. There's only one in this family. And I'm sorry it doesn't have a common name, but the botanical name is Bryoandersonii illicebra. This is a hypnum moss, H-Y-P-N-U-M moss, which uh, actually I've read uh, they used to stuff pillows with to impart pleasant dreams. Hmm. This is a very common moss you see growing in Warner Park on the stone walls. Anomadon attenuatus or poodle moss. This is one of the main mosses in my moss lawn called Brachythesium. Another moss that grows on those stone walls is another anomadon, anomadon rostratus or golden yarn moss. I mean, it, it's, it's the coolest looking stuff. And here's uh, some moss growing on some a stone foundation at uh, Elkmont in uh, the Smoky Mountains. This is a dicranum or what people call mood moss just growing on a boulder on our property. This looks like a little face right there. Mm -hmm. And then this is two different kinds of moss. This is the dicranum or mood moss here. And then this is the fern moss, which can turn this really, and you can see it there, kind of a golden color in the fall. And moss is an opportunist. Opportunist. It's growing, growing this atricum, at, atricum variety is growing in these little uh, crack in this rock. This is along the Blue Ridge Parkway where you really see moss at its best. It's covering logs and ferns growing up in it. It's a beautiful sight. And of course, many of you have seen this if you're in Warner Park. I love that little green edge right there. And again, these are the moss colored covered rocks here. Moss circle. That's uh, up on the Cumberland Plateau. This was a moss moment I had uh, at our friend's garden. We were looking, doing a garden tour and I spotted this moss and had to go become one with it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, again, here's the uh, tree moss, the climacium, next to the nion moss. Just quite a contrast. And this is another contrast of the entodon moss with the brachythesium moss. This is uh, always kind of fun. I've got daffodil in front of my office, my log cabinet office, where I'm doing this 
presentations for you guys. Uh, have daffodils planted that come up through the moss, and you can see sections like there where they actually lift the moss up. And I just, I can just pull it right off and replant it. This is a Pachysandra ground cover next to the Brachythesium moss. And in Warner Park, uh, I love this is the uh, Anomadon oh, moss cool. with lichens. It's just what a really cool combination. This is Ivan hanging out on my moss lawn. This is the log cabin office. I just had to keep moss going on down there too. Our moss family. <laughs> and uh, talking about resources, I shared with you uh, Annie Martin's book, The Magical World of Moss Gardening. Uh, it's a great book. It's a timber press book and uh, she's done really well with it. And uh, you can go to mountainmoss.com and uh, order it directly from her. It really helps her versus uh, ordering it through Amazon or somebody like that. So if you can do that, and she would even sign a copy for you. Uh, this is a great book, The Common Mosses of the Northeast and Appalach Appalachians. It's a relatively new book, really good resource. One thing unique about it, it, uh, it does show when mosses are wet versus dry, they can look radically different. And they show pictures of that on mosses that do show that difference. So you can say, oh, well, it looks di completely different wet versus dry. So that's really handy. And then this Gathering Moss book by actually one of my favorite authors, Robin Wall Kimmerer. Uh, she wrote, also wrote the book, quite famous book now called Braiding Sweetgrass. And Gathering Moss is just an incredible book. I mean, if you have any interest in moss, it's just beautifully written. She uh, won a Natural History Writing Award. And uh, one thing that's really unique about her approach is that she is both a Potawatomi Native American and a scientist. So she weaves these two disciplines together in just a really beautiful uh, manner. And so I highly recommend that book. And we'll end with Keep On Mossing. This is a moss man who made his first debut at the Cullowhee Native Plant Conference some years ago now. Thanks for watching. Thank you very hey. much, Paul. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately on Zoom, uh, applause doesn't work very well because it always just jumps to the loudest uh, person clapping. But uh, let's all wave at Paul for his big <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, we got a few questions that came up. Um, if you want to, uh, Sue, if you want to unmute yourself, you had a couple of questions, uh, Sue Bible, or I can just ask them for you, whichever way you want to do it. You're still here, yeah. Um, actually, I don't even remember what the first one was. <laughs> uh, do you have to, when it was transitioning to oh. the new moss, did you have to keep the area moist? When you planted the moss in your sunny area, um, did you have to keep that real moist? Had to keep it more moist, again, just because it's getting a little more sun on it. Uh, but, uh, you know, especially I had to watch the transplanted moss. But, you know, the, the moss that was just kind of filling in on its own didn't seem to require that much extra moss. But, again, if it gets really, really dry, it'll just go dormant. But, and uh, did you plant the poly, poly, uh, polycarp moss in that sunny area as well? Uh, that's all, uh, that's all the, the, the pluricarp, pretty much all the spreading. I, I like that, uh, I like that flatter look for a moss lawn, Yeah. but that's just a personal preference. And uh, some of the acrocarp uh, varieties, the, the mounding forms that you see used a lot in the, in the florist trade, you know, they put them on the top of pots. Uh, that moss actually is, uh, well, first of all, a lot, a lot of that moss is, uh, number one, uh, ripped off from the wild and a lot of times it's treated. Now I will say about uh, Annie's uh, uh, mossery in Brevard, North Carolina, she sustainably harvests moss. She, she goes into areas that are 
uh, developments are going in or roads going in or whatever and or people have like she'll rescue certain types of moss like off a roof of a house even so you got to be sure you know your sources are not stealing it from from uh, from the wild that answer your question uh, yes thank you mm -hmm. I and then see you also ask if that was actually a shop vac he was working <laughs> yeah. on it, what's that is, was that actually a shop vacuum that you were using in your yard? I have used a shop vac. And what I, what I do is when I, when I blow the leaves and there's nuts, the nuts gather on the edges. And then, so oh. then I take the vac and go along, and suck up the nuts on the edge, and then I just throw them out into the woods. Very good. You get creative. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about, um, I noticed that you don't seem to have much trouble with honeysuckle. Oh, oh, contraire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so what do you do to keep the honeysuckle? That's one question. My second question is, uh, we live um, on top of a hill in, in Westmead, and we have bedrock. Um, and uh, we've heard that if you scratch a surface and then put moss on it, um, you can uh, sort of propagate it on rock. Because you're helping the um, you're helping the um, water collecting and so forth, um, not roots, but whatever you had a name for them, um, get established. Do you know where you can get the kind of um, moss that is used in Warner that is on the rock at Warner Park and the vertical surfaces? Uh, not well. The vertical surfaces, no. Uh, on the flat surfaces, that entodon moss is a good one. And, and uh, where do you get it? Mountainmoss.com. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, she's got that variety. You know, some of the varieties, you know, just don't propagate that well or not as, or don't grow as readily uh, in Brevard. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, I got, she's my go-to for, for most anything else and, you know, I'm able to transplant on my property. I've got you know, little pockets of this or that type of moss. And then if I'm trying to learn or grow a different variety, I might order something for fun into that new moss area that's in front of the house. Yeah. What do you do about the honeysuckle? Uh, well, I've got uh, the mo most of the honeysuckle I have is the bush honeysuckle, the, the uh, armor, right. aimer hun honeysuckle. It didn't look like your woods had too much of it, though. Oh, it's, I just, it's just pushed back. I've got thousands of it. I mean, I've, I've spent, I mean, I'm on 12 acres. There's absolutely no way to, to manage it like you, I mean, to eradicate it. So I just keep it pushed back from the, from the, from the lawn and moss area. You don't, you don't use the sheep? No. Or goats? No, I don't, I don't, I, I think it'd be almost, my, you know, my hills are straight up and down and I don't oh, know they how can do it. They can do it. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I'm, I'd, I'd be afraid to where, where they, when they, where they would stop. <laughs> <laughs> See, next on the question list, Rita, you had a question. Yes. Am I on? The, the spell the scientific name of rose moss, please. Okay. We got it right here. I'm gonna say it first and then I'm gonna spell it for, for you. It's Rhodobryum ontariense. R-H-O-D-O-B-R-Y-U-M. And the ontariense is O-N-T-A-R-I-E-N-S-E. -E. Got it? You're muted, Alice. We can't hear you. You're muted. Yeah, I got R O D O N what? Okay, Rhodobryum is R H O D O B R Y U M. And Ontariense is O N T. A R I E N S E. Recently, recently it had just kind of rained, and the water droplets 
on the leaves of that. Uh, you take a close-up photo and that's just magnificent on those things. Oh yes, I love, you know, I love the water drops on them. That's, that's, that's half the fun. I, uh, okay. I, animals uh, disturbing the, the moss on, uh, on my driveway and whatever. So uh, I got to put a, I got shade plus that I don't need anymore. I should put that on, but it's, it's a lot of acreage, but I would like to save some moss and not have it just completely scratched up overnight. Yeah, well, anything newly newly planted should be should be covered. It's sure. not. We're not talking about newly planted. We're talking about nature, nature, and you have the moss today and tomorrow. It's all churned up. Well, that's uh, there's not much you can do about that. I mean, I, I see it happening in the park a lot, and you know it'll just eventually heal back. But there's nothing you can do, short of physically covering it to keep them away. Now, I'll tell you something I have done that's that's seems to be working. I did some little moss plugs in my moss lawn and I bought some metallic pinwheels and put them in the area. And I've had almost like no damage at all from birds this, this year. So uh, that might be a little tip that you could do in an area or someone might do in a new area that they've put the moss. Are there any mosses that will work in alkaline soil? I find that they're actually, yes, the answer is yes. And most of them really don't require acidic soil. I mean, of course, in Warner Park, those are limestone, you know, basically limestone types of, of stone. So, uh, yeah, there's quite a few that will. The, the, the anomadons and the brachytheciums, uh, quite a few, actually. Okay. So if you have One thing I will moss. dispel is uh, kind of the moss milkshake thing that goes around about taking uh, moss and putting it, you know, mixing it with buttermilk and mixing it up and pouring it over rocks. That's really just kind of a waste of time. Oh, that, that was actually the next question. Yeah, that was. <laughs> it always comes up. <laughs> And let's see, Rita, you had one more question, it looks okay, like. So you talked about um, moss that you had on a bird bath. So how mm -hmm. do you clean the bird bath then if you've got moss on it that you want to preserve the moss? But you need it's just, to... it's an excellent old stone that's been carved out and, uh -huh. it, and it just forms on the outside. And actually, uh, you know, box turtles uh, come to that area too. They, they climb in there. I call it my box turtle hot tub. I've had as many as. <laughs> four or five box turtles in there at one time and uh and it just forms on the outside and uh so so this is not on a pedestal then it's no it's flat on the ground the but it's, it's good size it's probably 30 36 inches across oh okay five or six it's inches a natural deep. a big stone depression right. sort of oh, okay yeah that sounds beautiful and paul had a question uh when you were converting to moss you got rid of your grass you had dirt there but your moss wasn't fully grown in. Did you fight a battle with the common yard weeds uh, that just invade and take over dirt spaces? Not, not too much, not as much as you would think, you know. Um, uh, not really, I mean, you'd get some things come in and I would just pull them up, you know, I wouldn't let them get, I, the key is not let them get ahead of you. But if you're out there kind of blowing every day, and I mean, I, I have found, you know, what a lot of people too about a moss will go, I don't want to hand weed. And I said, well, just have a smaller moss area. I mean, you don't, you don't have to have a huge area. Uh, you can just have just a little tiny area of it. I mean, I just find that it's, that it's such a peaceful thing to, you know, to, to weed, to go out there and just kind of groom it and uh, spend time with it. And, you know, I mean, and even like, uh, I love how moss smells when you first water it. It just has this incredible earthy metallic kind of aroma to it. So you yeah, can just start small and, you know, I, I, I do things on a big scale uh, when I'm experimenting and I, you know, maybe at some point I might reduce the size and have more bed space for woody native plants or something, but so far it's fun. 
Yeah, I think that's the key to landscaping in general. You don't want to install more than you can maintain. Right. And I tell people I have the, the 50 foot garden hose rule or the 75 foot garden hose rule. I mean, if you're having to hand water, don't plant beyond what those hose links will do. Because the, the drier it gets, the less you are to get that extra length of hose to go water that other section. Yeah. Good advice. <laughs> Are, are there any um, non-native invasive mosses? Not really. I mean, you know, there's, and if you plant, you know, like a, a grouping of moss, there'll always be one that'll outperform the other, but, you know, not in some negative way. I, I call that moss mingling. You know, I just let whichever one wants to be the dominant one is fine. And a lot of times they'll just mix and be quite happy coexisting. I had some moss that came in um, behind some um, hydrangeas. They were pink diamond. They got about mm -hmm. 10 feet tall. We finally, um, they, they ended up, they're not there now, but on the brick, there's this beautiful moss growing around the bottom. Does it hurt the mortar or your brick home? No. It doesn't. Not at all. I've actually taken, even on like, uh, I've got, pieces of moss that are growing on my asphalt shingles. Yeah. And I peeled it up and the shingle looks like it's brand new under there. Huh. Ah, so, because they don't have roots, as you say. Roots, right. So this, this uh, rhizoid just goes sideways? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of just yeah. hangs on lightly. Right. Okay. And there's a, type, there's a type of moss called Hedwigia moss uh -huh. that I uh, uh, saw growing on a 100 year old slate roof in full sun. Wow. Wow. Uh, it doesn't okay. get any hotter than that. That's like being in an oven. Um, can you use iNaturalist to identify what your moss is in your yard? <laughs> I haven't used iNaturalist for that. I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. It only works on really obvious mosses. Really? Um, yeah. yeah. It has to had, be. I've had bad luck. <laughs> yeah, it has to have striking characteristics. Yeah, probably like that Bryo Andersonii or the Climacium, you know, those real distinct varieties would probably... Yeah, the one with the rosette, I think, might work. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. so what do you do if you want to know what's growing in your yard? Where do you take well, you have to buy these, you know, you have to buy these books and just look at the photos. Is there a Facebook page for moss lovers? I'm, I'm sure there is. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> How many moss Facebook pages are you? A group uh, it's are act, you it's actually a, a pretty big group. I'm going to look it up here. <laughs> I'm going to look it up here while we get everybody. Go green with moss. Okay. And uh, you go check it out, and I can I can sign you in as a member or whatever. But it's a it's a quite active group. Did you start it? Oh no, I think my friend Andy Martin did. Oh okay okay. And uh, it's, it's grown quite a bit. I'm always posting on that or, and, uh, or trying to ID stuff for people. But, you know, you got to get good photos to, to ID. My, even with that, I mean, sometimes you can't. Again, you got to have a, you know, hand lens or microscope or something. But if you at least get good, good photos and uh, if you, another identifying uh, time to, to identify mosses is when they're producing those sporophytes, those little needle-like. Oh, okay because those are pretty distinct in another identifier. So you want a shot from the side and then from the top, mm -hmm. preferably with a macro. And then... I, I, get, I get great stuff with my iPhone. Okay. Well, and some of the iPhones have macro lenses. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. So, um, and then if it has sporophytes, then that, that right. would really be, a, okay, right. great. But definitely get the, get a, you know, a couple, you got to have a couple of reference books, so. Okay. On, uh, on your picture of the lichen and, and the moss together, and that's a, that's a, a pertigera or pertigera uh, lichen, and they have actually less rhizoid uh, uh, root type system, and that's the rhizines that are just standing out as white little hairs underneath. And oh, wow. you best uh, hunt for those right after, uh, shortly after a rain, and uh, they grow great on the limestone. Yeah, that's when I photographed that. I've passed it many times, 
and it's just that one stage where it just had just the right amount of moisture in it where it really photographed well. That is cool. And Richard, I have a suggestion for the organization. That yes. We all go uh, go out and take uh, uh, photographs of of Mars. I have a bunch, and <laughs> when we really meet again, uh, sometime go back to go back to this in showing it either in in a in a slide version or or in print or whatever that the meeting can. Uh, can go back to the time when we did this over the computer. Yes, I've uh, actually oh. think, think I'm thinking about starting an informal meeting. Maybe uh, let's see. We, we meet monthly formally with a presentation, but yes. two weeks after that, we could have another meeting that didn't have such a structure to it, and we would just exchange ideas. One week we could just show and tell pictures from our yard. Yeah. You know? Just do have a have a topic, a loose topic, but not a structure attached to it. So I may uh, run that up the flagpole and see um, see how that works. But I would like to do that. Uh, you know, I think we need to get together more than every once a month, and I think that might be a good thing to do uh, two weeks after this meeting. So yeah. I have one yes. more question. Okay, I have a daughter-in-law that loves yoga, and she's from California, so she's always looking for different yoga places she so does your do your daughter still do the moss yoga on your uh they they haven't been doing that of course you know now they can't really can't i mean right right and maybe soon they can but yeah they, they haven't done that in a while um but uh she should uh i mean they've got some credible online things that they're offering now yep. what's their company again the it's triluna wellness T-R-I-L-U-N-A, trilunawellness.com. And okay. my daughter's name is Elizabeth Moore, and she has a partner, Ashley Brooke James, that, that they work together. But they they do some really cool stuff, some some really amazing cooking type things, too. Okay. It's okay. all about wellness and all that good stuff. Yeah, I'll check it out. Thank That's you. good. Any other questions for Paul? Paul, I think you should do a book. <laughs> <laughs> my father you know the only thing that my father-in-law has really been after me for some years now about doing a photographic book uh and i mean i'll post something on facebook he goes one for the book one for the book <laughs> one for the book the only yeah. thing about that being an introvert like i am then i'd have to go on tour and i'd have to talk to lots of people and be in crowds and stuff <laughs> i don't think i want to do, do that. that anyway don't you uh, yeah, no, but you could, really. you could use Zoom. You could use Zoom for all that. Yeah, well, yeah, you go. It's the time to have stay it. right at home. <laughs> Rita, your butterfly, your butterfly book is a perfect format for him. Oh, for uh, Paul. Yeah. Like butterflies and moth mosses, or. Well, I meant it, it, creating that moss book using the same format that you use. Oh, a field guide. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Field guide to mosses. Well, there probably isn't one. Or is there Mosses of Tennessee. <laughs> there well, that, you go. But see, then you start to narrow down your audience. And they say, well, no, I'll do one on a larger area. You know, sell more books. And you know, there you yeah, go. There's a pretty popular butterfly book that did that, though. Well, you can cut your crowds that way, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when, I was in, when I was in retail, uh, my work partner, Robin Brown, you know, she, you know, knows about, uh, knew about me being an introvert. And I said, you know, I feel like when I get up every day, I have, I can only say so many words. And if I use them up by 10, I can't talk anymore. <laughs> uh, well, thank you again, Paul. That was yeah. great. Uh, it was my pleasure. Great. It's, we got a real, I, I didn't put in the introduction that you were a professional photographer. I, uh, I decided to let the audience figure that out uh, and see how long <laughs> it took. But <laughs> no, that's fine. So that was great. Well, uh, I think we're done, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, what was the maximum attendance, Brian? Did you keep a, keep an eye on that? We had twenty something at some point. You're you're muted, Brian. Uh, so you saw my mouth moving. Yes, I think we had twenty seven. <laughs> 25. Okay. okay. Yeah, actually. 25 plus David was here too. At the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> David. 
<laughs> oh, you mean that empty chair? <laughs> yeah, he's still there. He'll be back. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, everybody. I'll, I'll keep emailing you and let you know when the next gathering is. Thank you Thanks for coming. For Thanks for tuning in, everybody. I appreciate All it. All right. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Very Bye. fun. Bye, everybody. It was Bye. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.